Miss Major Griffin Gracie and Director Annalise Ophelian join me live in Studio Q. Welcome to the studio. Thank Thanks you so much. For much. Having us. Uh, Annalise, I'll start uh, with you. What was the impetus uh, for making this doc about Miss Major? Well, particularly for those of us in the San Francisco Bay Area, Miss Major is an icon. If you're in queer and trans community in the Bay, you've gotten to see her work firsthand, and we're all very much in awe of her and aware of the way that she paved the road for the rest of us. Um, I had the privilege of meeting Miss Major in 2008 when she gave me an interview for my first feature, and we had the opportunity to just build a relationship after that, and there was a moment where she said, look, people have been saying I need a film about my life, and I would like to work on it with you, so I was really honored that she asked me to, to step in. Okay, uh, Miss Major, it's okay if I call you Miss Major? Oh, yes, of course it is. Okay. Um, you've had quite a life so far. It's hard to know where to start, but I want to start in Chicago, where mm-hmm. you grew up. Uh, what was like uh, life like for you as a teenager, going to drag balls and, and trying to be who you were as a teenager in Chicago? Well, it was, that part of it, going to the balls and hanging out with friends was comfortable. Uh, however, being in high school and having to run from boys or be chased home or not get a chance to go out individually by myself because of how I presented was kind of difficult. Mm. But Chicago was a good place to be. A lot of jazz clubs, a lot of interesting people and things going on. So it was fun. Uh, a, a time that you remember well uh, in this film is New York. Uh, oh, you, mo- yeah. you moved there in 1962 after being expelled from two colleges for, mm-hmm. for wearing dresses. When did you become uh, politicized as a trans activist? At what point was that? Um, I always cared about the girls earlier uh, due to the fact that we were getting murdered so much and nobody seemed to care. I lost a lot of good friends. But I think I became aware and awake uh, when I was in Attica and Dana Moore when I met James Black. Okay, well, I want to I want to visit that time a, a little bit later, but first, mm-hmm. uh, let's stay in New York uh, for a moment. Sure. Uh, so June 27th, 1969, mm-hmm. you were at the Stonewall Inn yes. uh, the day the famous rebellion occurred. Can you set the scene uh, for us? What happened that evening and, and who was there? Um, well, there were a lot of people there because somebody's birthday was happening, and we always partied there uh, after work. And uh, it was primarily just a thing that happened simply because the police had been doing what they do regularly all across the United States, coming to the bars, knocking on the door jam with their nightsticks, and you stepping away from somebody you're with, slowly walking out of the bar so they could see what minors were there or who didn't belong there in the club and stuff, and then send you home and close the bar down for that night. That was the routine. That's the regular routine. And it was just this night, it didn't seem like that is what was going to happen. They knocked on the jam, the lights came on, and no one budged. It was just It was just a feeling in the air that... Just, it was just there. No planning, no one mapped it out or written out things. You know, they were, oh, we're going to have this fight. You know, nothing like that happened. Because that was the day everyone was feeling the same feeling of no more... No yeah. more harassment, yeah. no more brutality. It just stopped. It wow. just all came to a head and stopped. What are your strongest memories of that particular night? I think my strongest memories was when we were outside the bar and we were fighting the police, we were kicking their behinds and uh, hearing the people across the street cheering. The girls are kicking <laughs> ass, you know. So it became a very interesting thing at the time. Mm. And I think... The one conscious thought I remember having was being told by friends in Chicago that if you're ever in a confrontation with a cop, piss him off and get him to knock you out so they don't break your bones and continue to beat you up. So that's this what was I advice did. that was just passing around oh, in Chicago. We, yeah, well, you have to teach others, you know, what to do to protect themselves in those kind of situations because they were so regular. It wasn't a random thing; it was something that happened on a regular basis, and you could wind up in that position at any time. Trans women are often left out of the narrative of Stonewall. Mm-hmm. Sure. Why do you think that is? Uh, because white people think they own the world. It's really simple. They feel that, well, if we were there even across the street cheering you on, we're the reason that you were there because we allowed you to be there. So, of course, they feel as if they have dominion over everything. Uh, Just pick up a history book. After you get through all the lies, how many pages are left? Two? So, do you feel yeah. like that history has cleared up over time at much, or do you feel like the, the, the story, the legacy um, remains the same and remains inaccurate? It hasn't changed much. What it's done is it's uh, covered itself up and camouflaged itself so that people will look past it onto something else and denigrate and demonize 
where they're looking instead of the car at the cause. Uh, Annalise, uh, Miss Major has been a strong activist for trans women of color in prison. Um, mm. Can you give us a sense of why they are so uh, disproportionately represented? in the prison system, because your film goes into this. Certainly. Yeah. I mean, I think particularly in the United States, the prison industrial complex is like a textbook lesson in intersectionality. And trans women of color live at the center of so many ex- intersections of oppression. So trans misogyny and white supremacy and the way that the war on drugs has, you know, overwhelmingly demonized and caused the incarceration of huge swaths of American society. Um, you really see that show up. Um, the way that trans women of color are more visible in community and then more vulnerable to police harassment um, and to police attention. Um, And, you know, Angela Davis is uh, in the film, at the beginning of the film, she talks about the way that trans women of color have so much to teach us about the prison industrial complex because some of the worst abuses, some of the most egregious over-criminalization happens within this group. And so if we really want to see what's wrong with prisons in the United States, we can see all of it sort of in the experience that trans women of color have to survive there. So trans women of color aren't just overrepresented in prison. They also face greater discrimination and violence once they are on the inside. Absolutely. Um, Let's get back to this experience that you mentioned uh, where you became politicized. Sure. Um, Tell us about that. You were were in jail. You spent some time in jail in Sing Sing, Sing, uh, Mm -hmm. in Attica in 1971 Mm -hmm. after riots broke out and inmates uh, demanded better living conditions. And Dannemora. And Denimore as well. As well. Uh, how did how did all those experiences uh, politicize you? Inform your activist work? Uh, it affected me when I was in Denimore in the hole, and I met the men who had started the Attica riot. And in talking and meeting with them there, um, got to listen to the abuses that the police were putting them through. And you're there twenty three hours out of the day. So we wound up talking to one another. They were very open. They didn't treat me any different knowing that I was, uh, at the time, transgender wasn't a very popular word, so that I was this sissy down the cell block from them. So we talked, and in talking to them, he made me aware of the fact that what I was doing was important, but I needed to know the reasons why it had gotten this bad and what I could do to really help my community versus giving them a Band-Aid over a cut. So, so. he educating you on, on the, the deeper political issues, yes, sociological issues? Yes, why they were, what was going on with them, and the things to do to throw a monkey wrench into the apple cart, to upset it, to shake it up, to get it to change because that's what all of us wanted to do at the time. Everybody was trying to do something, you know. Women wanted to have equal pay. Uh, Blacks wanted to get their rights as human beings. My community wanted to be respected for who we were. Everybody was looking for their piece of this supposedly American pie, Mm -hmm. you know, hoping that it would be an equal share, and it's not an equal share. How did it feel to receive that knowledge? I mean, you'd been through so much at that point. As you Mm -hmm. said, you'd seen friends die, Mm -hmm. Uh, you'd been in prison. How did it feel to receive that knowledge about, hey, here here might be a way to unravel this thing and actually make progress, not just Band-Aid solutions? How did it feel to receive those kind of light bulbs? It was hopeful. It was a thing of, well, maybe some little things can get it to change. Because when you're fighting like that and you're at the grassroots level, you don't see what's above you. You don't know what can happen from what you're doing where you are. And so in going through that, just in speaking about it and having somebody else verbalize what we were feeling inside my girls and I uh, was simply amazing because it was like, okay, if we do this, maybe we can get somebody, one person, to go, well, wait a minute, they're not that bad, Mm -hmm. you know, and they're not an abomination. And with what they've gone through, they have plenty of courage, you know. Uh, Annalise, your your film reveals how Miss Major is much more than an activist. Uh, She's a community leader, uh, a mother Mm -hmm. to so many. Um, Describe for us what is Miss Major to her community? well, I think, if you I mean, can try and put it into into words, I mean, <laughs> I can give you my observation. I think I'd, I'd want her community to just to speak for themselves. But certainly, my observation of it is that Miss Major's activism 
um, is this particular activism of individual caretaking. Um, and it's in this day and age especially really rare, this uh, prioritizing people over policy. And it's survival-based, right? That for the whole of her life, the thing that we got to witness, the story we heard over and over, were the ways that Major would sort of reach back and help a girl along and help them not only like kind of get up to, you know, on their on their feet, but then move forward and really thrive in the world. And so all of these women who gave us interviews for this film talked about the ways that Major would bring them food if they were hungry, get them a hotel room if they didn't have a place to stay, um, you know, teach them how to paint, like show them the ways to just sort of be in their bodies and in their strength in the world. And then in turn, each of those women have gone on and done that for other folks. So I think about someone like Janetta Johnson, mm -hmm. who's um, one of Miss Major's daughters and has stepped into the executive director position at TGIJP. And she's now doing this work for the girls around her. So it's this exponential activism. It's amazing. Story after story in this film of individual care, uh, people saying that you say Miss Major uh, basically saved their life. What was it like watching this film story after story? Every time I see it, I cry because it brings back so many good memories and horrible memories and things that I thought I was over that I'm not over. And it makes me feel alive and recharges my battery to keep going because I'm still here and this stuff still has to change. And I need to keep doing what I'm doing because there's other girls out there, young girls who need to know that they come from a history, that this didn't start with Janet Mock and Laverne Cox. This has been years in the making, that we're in the Bible, you know, and that we've been here since time began. You know. What do you love most about your community? Our resilience, you know, that, you know, okay, you knock me down, B, and I'm going to get up and stop this from happening to me a second time, mm -hmm. you know. And that with all that we've gone through, we're still there. We're still going to rise. We're still going to get up, dust ourselves off, change our outfit, and go out there again and again and again. What issues are you most passionate about right now? Right now, I think the thing that's important to me is to get people to back up off us as a community and stop trying to create laws that will chase us back into the closet or act as if we don't exist or we're not here. Um, it's a matter of making sure that, you know, when most of us came out of the closet as transgender women, we burnt the house down. So there's no closet to go back to, and they're going to have to deal with that. How far uh, do you think we've come at this point uh, when it comes to trans rights? There's been some really interesting differences from when I was growing up, you know, um, but there's still bullying. There's still hate. You know, I think the visibility that we have with the girls who are in the media and more popular um, affects the girls who are on the ground still having to hook to survive or sell drugs or prostitute and that they're dying because of the popularity that everybody else is receiving because people can't get to them but they can get to some girl that's out there trying to make it mm -hmm. who's on the street with them you know so i would want them to realize that you know you have to stop making these folks pay for what somebody else is doing and wake up and realize that we're all human beings and Elise, same question to you. How far do you think we've come in terms of in terms of trans rights? You know, I think when we were making the film, marriage equality was the sort of most significant um, LGBT mm -hmm. issue, and it was interesting. We kind of came back over and over to this theme that the things that Miss Major was fighting for at Stonewall were things like fighting back against uh, police abuse, um, police brutality, and and criminalization, and that that agenda hasn't changed. And so the the core um, sort of impetus of our movement has always been one for equality and rights and safety for the most vulnerable among us. And th these kind of socially conservative topics like military service and marriage have not been the overriding agenda of our communities. It's the things Miss Major has been fighting for. And I think those basic safety concerns remain as significant today as they've ever been. What do you think a film like this that offers this, this historical perspective, decades of activism, what do you think that gives to the movement to see the mm -hmm. history? 
Mm. Uh, versus just kind of this moment right now that happens to be getting a lot of attention. Well, it's two things. One thing I really hope folks take away from the film is the sense of Miss Major and her community through history. So I think, folks, it's easy to reduce things to Stonewall, but like I know we feel really passionately about the story of Attica and about these places where um, community survival comes together and pushes the movement forward. So to see, as Miss Major says so frequently, where we didn't just you know become created. We've been here all along. We've been a part of these movements on the ground level. I also think it happens in LT LGBT communities often that when a person hits like 45 or 50, they become our elder because we have so few elders in our community. And it's so vitally important to have someone like Miss Major who's in her 70s there giving us that powerful role model of I am at this age and I want my girls to be getting to this age along with me. Final question to you, uh, Miss Major. What are your hopes for the future? What's the hope that keeps you going uh, in your activism even now? Well, my hope would be that the younger girls who are just realizing that they're transgendered can do so safely, that their parents respect their choices and help them along and don't push them out, uh, that the bullying and the persecution from society and the mainstream and people stop, and that people step back and realize, you know, well, they've had to go through a lot to get here, and they should be respected for that, you know. It's great to have you both here. Thank Thanks you. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks so much for having us.